But just first a little brief history about me. Um, I worked on mobile games, PC casual games. I worked on a point-and-click adventure game, a cancel game. I've also worked on AAA titles with publishers like Microsoft and EA, and a few other titles. Right now, I'm lead programmer at uh, Lionbyte in Stockholm. It's a small indie startup. And we're currently working away on our first title called Reign of Reflections. It's a cyberpunk noir game with a dystopian future and has some turn-based combat, sort of like XCOM. First, I just want to give a little brief introduction to the whole talk. Uh, here's the overview. So first, I'll introduce the topic. We'll talk a little bit about pathfinding. We'll talk about link costs and search spaces, and the tiles and links that we use in our game, and later how we translate this into movement using Bezier curves. And finally, how we construct our animation segments. Right. So, I just want to clarify a little bit about what I mean when I say turn-based. And it has everything to do with player input. That in real-time games, like fighting games or action games, when the player pushes the controller or pushes a button, he or she expects immediate uh, that something happens with his character or her character. While in turn-based games, the player gives some kind of input and a sequence of actions plays out. So we can have two completely different uh, s structures when we do our animation systems. We can do this in completely different ways. So what I'm going to talk to you to today about is not only about turn-based games. You can use it for other things as well, like AI movement or something like that. So usually what happens is that you get a path from the pathfinding system. Then it's up to the animation system to make the character walk along this path looking as good as possible. This is usually done with some form of animation graph like the one you see. You have lots of animations. And we also started with this approach when we did it. But as we were adding more and more animations, we needed more and more transitions between those animations and more and more parameters to control those transitions. And the complexity just snowballed after a while. So I'm going to talk about a different approach, a simpler approach that we're trying out. But first, let's talk a little bit about pathfinding algorithms in general and how they work. This is a map that we want to find a path on. And let's see. It's, there we go. This is the father of pathfinding algorithms. His name is Edsger W. G Jikstra. And in 1956, he made Jikstra's algorithm, which is an algorithm for finding the shortest path on a set of connected nodes, or what we also call a graph. There we go. Bit of a delay. So the object of the game is to get the ball to the cross. I'm not going to go into much technical detail of how the algorithms work, but I'm going to show them to you so you get an idea of how they work. But we start with the tile under the ball. This is the start node. And we add it to the open list. This is a list of nodes that we want to investigate in the future. From this open list, we pick the node that is closest to the starting position. And we mark this as the current node. This is now shown in green. After that, we add the neighbors of this node to the open list. And we store a link back to the node that added them to this list. I know it's a bit hard to follow, but y you'll see it in action, and it makes, becomes clear. 
After we've done this, we mark the current node as visited. This means that we've been there, we've done that, we're not, no longer interested in this node. So we mark it as visited, and in the future we won't come back to it. Then we just repeat this process over and over again until this happens. Here we have a node that's been added to the open list, but we've found a shorter path leading to the same node. And you see this parent link marked in red. This is a shorter path to this node, and so we just update this parent link and carry on. You can see how this algorithm spreads out in a circular fashion. From the start, always picking the node that's closest to the start. And it does this all until it finds the goal. After this, it's easy to construct the path by just following the parent links all the way back to the start. And voila, there's our shortest path. Now, these three guys in 1968 came up with the game industry's most popular pathfinding algorithm called the A-star algorithm. It's extending Jigstra's algorithm by adding heuristics. It's a fancy way of saying that they optimized it. Again, we start with the same start and finish. And it works almost the same, so we add the start node to the open list. But here's the crucial difference. Instead of picking the one that's closest to the start, we pick the one that's closest to the start and the one that has the least estimated distance left to the goal. This gives the algorithm a direction, so it's not just searching out in a circular fashion, it's searching in the direction of the goal. Again, we add the neighbors, we mark it as visited. Oop. Let's see how it spreads out. You can see it's clearly searching in the direction of the goal, and in doing so, it finds the same shortest path, but it visits a lot less nodes in the, in the search space, making it a lot more cheap to use. And today is still one of the most popular used algorithms for pathfinding in games. So, link costs. This is the cost to go from one tile on the map to another. It's not always that we want to find the shortest path. Sometimes we want to avoid expensive tiles like this muddy hole. So you see, all the links leading into this hole are marked as expensive. So it's going to give us two different paths. When we feed in expensive links to the algorithm, it's going to find not the shortest path, it's going to find the optimal path, the one with the least total cost to get from the start to the finish. Yep. Another thing that we need to talk about is bidirectional links. In the previous example, it's always been the same cost to go from left to right as from right to left. However, that's not always the case. It doesn't have to be the same cost to go left to right as to right from right to left. There we go. Just something to keep in mind. Here's a little bit more illustrative example of this. Imagine that you're going uphill. It's always more exerting than going downhill. And so we can here, we plugged in the link cost to the elevation. So even though you see the longer path, the lower one, the green one, is cheaper in cost. But it's much more faster for the ball to get from point A to point B. So here's a good example, you see. We pathfind, or we found the path from these two points, but depending on where you search from, you get two different paths. All 
All right, so you know how the search algorithms work. You know how we can manipulate the link costs to get different paths and avoid expensive areas. Like if you have a like RTS game and you want to avoid swamp tiles or something like that, you just mark them as expensive. Now let's have a look at some search spaces. So these are the spaces in which these algorithms can operate. Starting with one that's very common in the games. It's a square grid. Some games allow links just horizontal and vertical, while others also allow diagonal movement. And if that's the case, any tile can have up to eight neighbors. But the algorithm doesn't care about this. You can use it for hexagonal search spaces as well. All it cares about is that it's a node connected to other nodes with links. So for example, this is also a perfect search space for this algorithm. You have the scrambled eight puzzle where each link is a move, resulting in new nodes, which in turn have new moves. And somewhere on this tree of future possibilities is the final finished eight puzzle, the green one. So these algorithms are good for finding the shortest path in this search space as well, the least amount of moves that will finish the puzzle. Same goes for the Rubik's Cube. So it's just a good side note to not think of these algorithms as just path-finding algorithms. They find shortest paths in any search spaces. So in our game, we have a few tiles and links I want to show you starting with the search base itself. It's a variation of a square grid. We have one by one unit between each tiles. We have a tile center. So this is where the unit will be standing, or a cover will be, or some kind of obstacle. We also have walls. This is something that separates two tiles. And we have corners. This is the little corner that's between four tiles. I'll give you some examples here. Covers, for example. They are placed in this tile center, and you can see how they affect pathfinding. Walls are placed on the wall spot, and they block movement between two tiles. And corners or pillars, they block movement diagonally. When you take all these pieces, you can put them together into complex objects. Yes, you can. And so our artist can build any form or shape of objects. And you see how it works well with the pathfinding system. In our game, we also have height difference. So you have different levels, and they're connected together with these stair nodes and these stair links, which we'll talk a little bit more about right now. I'm going to show you the, some of the links that we have in our game. Not all of them, but this is just a few examples to illustrate the point. You've already seen the normal links. So this is the links that connect two adjacent tiles together. You've seen the stair links. They connect two levels together. But we also have special moves. So it's a move that plays an animation that takes a character from one tile to another, and it doesn't have to be an adjacent tile. Like in this case, it's going to play an animation of somebody jumping over this low cover. Or like this roll link, where the character will do a somersault from one cover to another, if there's an unprotected tile between them. And we have corner links. So it plays an animation that smoothly takes them around a 90 degree corner. Now, let's have a look at this tile. Here it's showing all the outgoing links from this one particular tile. And so when the search algorithm is searching the space and getting to this tile, it's going to evaluate all these links and pick the one that brings it closest to the goal. Let's have a pathfinding example in this search space. There. That's the shortest path to get from the start to the finish. 
in this search base. And as you see, it's not just a set of normal links, it's a complex path with a few different moves involved. Keep this one in mind, and we'll get back to this one in a little while. <coughs> Stuck. Oh. So let's talk about how we translate this into movement for the characters. You found the path, and now we're going to move along it. So this is linear movement. And you see it's blocky. Every time she turns a corner, it's very abrupt. We want something a little bit more smooth, and this is where Bessier curves come in. Same path, but much smoother. Now, Bessier curves is a great tool for the programmer to use. It has lots of nice properties. Again, I'm not going to go into any mathematical detail here, but it's basically built up of a set of points and an interpolation value between these points. And then using this mathematical formula, you calculate the position on the curve. Here's just an example of a Bezier curve and how it looks when you move a control point around and moving the tangent. There is one big problem, though, with using Bezier curves. And that's that we're now going to plot points along this curve using a constant interpolation step. Notice the difference in these two areas. In the one to the left, the points are spaced further apart, and in the one to the right, they're crunched tightly together. So it means we can't use this interpolation value when we want to move our characters because it's not linear. The Bessier curves, the nature of the Bessier curves is that they are not linear, and that brings a problem. So what we first have to do is we sample a set of points on these, curves, and then move linearly between these points instead. And if we start with a big s sample step, and then you can see as we move it down, and you start to get to a smaller and smaller step, eventually you don't see the difference between the linearized version of the curve and the curve itself. And it's good enough to, for us to use for movement. Another good thing about Bessier curves is that we can get the direction at any point of the curve by simply taking the derivative of the position function. We could also sample two points on the curve and then just take a normalized vector, but this is much more cheap and elegant and also more accurate. Here you just see a small object taking its direction and rotation and position from the curve. And the final thing I want to talk to you about curves is curvature. So at any point on the curve, this is how much the curve is bending. Imagine that you're making a car game, for example, and the car is driving along the Bezier curve. This is a really good value, for example, for determining how much you want your front wheels to turn. Let's put this all into practice. See, we're getting the position from the linearized version of the Bessier curve, so she can move with a constant speed on the curve. We're getting the rotation from the curve. This is shown with this little orange arrow at her feet. And here, I'll show you exaggerated lean. So she's leaning into the curve as she's turning the corners, taking the curvature from the curve. The final thing we can do with this, which is a nice thing, is that we can sample ahead on the curve. So we take a future position on the curve, and we get the position there, and we use that for the head look of the character. So before she walks around the corner, she can anticipate and look that direction. These are all some very nice things that we get from using Bezier curves for movement. And now, Here's how we construct 
our animation segment. To do this, we need to get some information about each of the animation clips that we use. The most simple one to get is, of course, the length of the clip. How long is it in time? This particular one is 1.2 seconds. The next thing we want to get is movement. How long in distance does this animation clip move the character? So this is not the distance between the start and the end. It's the length of this red line that you see. Another thing that's very useful to have is the angle difference. What's the facing? What's the front facing of the character? The difference between the first and the last frame of the animation. In this clip, it's minus 90 degrees, or what non-programmer people call a left turn. The final thing is the foot forward. For each frame on in this animation, we want to know which foot is furthest forward in the character's direction. This is useful if we want to cut the animation short and blend into another animation. Sometimes we want to know which foot is forward so we know which animation to follow with, if it's a left foot or a right foot. Here we've just sampled the left foot and the right foot is just the inverted value of this curve. We do store some other things as well, like blend distances and foot impacts and things like that. I'll give you just a little quick look at the tool that we use for this. As you remember in the beginning, there was a big animation graph. We use a more table structure where each animation is listed. The animator can enter and tweak and tune blend values. But there's no transitions between animations here. And that's the difference. So let's get back to this one. We got a path, and we want to move along it. We want to think of a path as a set of animations that's going to take our character from point A to point B. So it's like a queue of animations to play. And this queue we get from the pathfinding system then with the different links that we have. So we start by getting our path. In this case, it's just a simple short path with a single vault in between. From this, we create the root motion curve. So this is the curve which the root of the character is going to move along as it goes from start to finish. On the top, you see a distance line. So this is not a timeline that we normally are used with, but it's a distance line of 0 to 100% along this root motion curve. Now we can start to add segments on this. We start with the start segment. So it's an animation clip that we know is going to take the character from standing still and idle to running. Sometimes it's a 180 degree turn to run. Sometimes it's a 90 degree right to run. Doesn't matter. We know how long it is because we pre-process it and we have it in the animation data. So this was the pre-processed length of this red line, if you remember. So that's the length on the distance time. Uh, blah the distance line. Then we go on and we add any special moves that we have on this path. In this case, it's just one single volt. We know, again, where it starts on the root motion curve, and we know how long it is. So we can place the segment. Finally, we add a stop segment. So this is the inverted version of the start. It just takes the character from running to stop. It's a nice thing that since we know how long this is, we can place it on the distance line so we know exactly that she's going to stop at the right position. And then the length goes to the left on the curve instead. Yeah. All these segments, they're the kind of animations that you play once, and they're not looping. Now, to fill in the gaps between, we simply take a looping run animation, and we add it with a little overlap wherever it's missing. Now we know the rough timing of the segment. So we know what's, what animations are going to be played in what order. And if you remember the, the tool, there was 
this tweak values that the animator could tweak. With them, we now correct this and we add the correct blend times. And there we go. That's our plan for blending between animations. And that's also going to move it the correct distance, uh, root motion wise, and deliver the character from start to finish. There's also a little lean there from the curvature. Let's take it again in slow motion. You can see how it goes from start. They're blending over to the run. Here comes the vault. Uh, yeah. And there's a lean from the curvature, like I said, and ending with a stop at the correct, correct position. This is still uh, in the experimental stage, I should say. It's a rough working version that hasn't been working for long, but it has the, the added bonus of not having to deal with transitions between each and every single animation state that you have. It's more than just that you plan it up, and then you let the system do the correct blends, and so on. And I believe that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, now would be a good time. No questions? Здравствуйте. А можно узнать, а что в этот момент делает капсула персонажа, ну, в которой находится сам аниматор, когда, например, персонаж перескакивает через ну, какое-то укрытие? Там. Ну, как она себя ведет? Там, она вверх поднимается или она э, просто через него проходит, а сама модель персонажа она поднимается вверх и опускается? I think I understand the question. <laughs> you're, you're wondering about the collision capsule and how when it moves through objects. The thing is, with turn-based games, since we don't actually really need a collision quick capsule for the character. Um, yeah, since we know that they're always standing at the center of the tiles, always ending at the center of other tiles, we can turn them on and off for the whole movement. We don't actually need them. Anyone else? Okay, hi, thank you. Um, the question is like, uh, so we've seen like one character, but we can have like different characters with like different move conditions. Like for example, we have, we have like a big character who can like, can't do some sharp uh, turns or like can't, can't go in uh, like small uh, corridors. Like uh, do we have such things or how you deal with them? Yeah, there's actually two ways we can deal with this. Um, what we have, per character or per character type, what we call a link evaluator. So when you do the pathfinding, you actually evaluate each link and say, can this character use this link or not? Because there are some links, like you say, that not all our characters can vault over covers, for example. Other have to run around. Um, another thing with the system is that in this table, we had a list of animations, we can also simply add different animations for different characters. So they can have different tables of animations. And if the animation system don't find a matching animation, that um, is simply also going to disallow that move. Hey, thanks Hello. for your speech. Uh, I have one question. Uh, what tools can I use to, well, uh, that helps me to do such things? Uh, this is done in Unity, but it's a custom-built system, basically. Okay. It's using this uh, new Playables API. It's an experimental Unity feature. So it's not using Mechanim to do these blends. Hopefully Unity is going to keep Playables, otherwise we're in trouble. <laughs> uh, hey there. Thanks Hello. for the speech. Uh, why have you... Uh, why 
you chose uh, squares. Why not hexagons or anything else? Uh, yeah, I guess that's, that was more up to our creative director, I think. But I think uh, the thing with squares is that it allows you to do square structures. And if you think of crates and boxes and containers on the level, they're very common. If you have hexagons, you're going to have overlaps where those um, objects sometimes cover half a hexagon because of the way they are spaced sort of uh, in interloping even. <laughs> but that's probably the main choice, main reason for the choice. Yeah, related to navigation and squares versus hexagons, uh, one of the problems with squares, at least what we find out, is that going from one square to one directly to uh, north, east, west, south, it's a distance of one unit, but going uh, diagonally, it's 1.4 units. How are you dealing with that? I mean, with hexagons, it's always the it's same, same distance. distance. Yeah, yes. it's the good thing with hexagons. Well, we just count it as one move. So if our character can move four tiles, that's also diagonal movement. You can do four tiles diagonally. That's how we solve it. But it is a downside with squares, absolutely. No more questions? Okay, then. Thanks. Right. A big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>